All right, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the third installment of the Vimy Foundation series, Beyond the Ridge, a series of conversations in partnership with the National Film Board of Canada. My name is Rose He. I am a 2019 Beaverbrook Vimy Prize alumna, and I will be beginning my first year in engineering as a Beaverbrook Award Scholar at the University of New Brunswick this fall. This webinar, titled War and the Environment, will explore the environmental impact of war and is presented in collaboration with the Toronto Zoo. We are very fortunate today to have an expert in nature with us today, Dolph de Young. Dolph de Young is currently Chief Executive Officer of, at the Toronto Zoo, having begun the role in September 2018. With a passion for protecting nature and understanding the challenges the world faces, he has been working with the zoo team, board of management, and community to complete a thorough review of the organization. He has shaped the Toronto Zoo's focus committing to raising its profile and working with partners to develop a new strategic plan that focuses on saving wildlife, delivering exceptional wow ex guest experiences, and connecting to underserved audiences, all the while revolutionizing zoo technology. So hello, Dolph. Welcome and thank you so much for spending your time with us here today to discuss war and the environment. Thank you so much. It's been a really exciting uh, few weeks getting to dive into the subject. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dolph, and thank you to everyone who has turned tuned into our webinar today. I would like to let everyone know that the last 15 minutes or so will be a question and answer period. If there are any questions that we haven't addressed in our discussion and that you're dying to know the answer to, you will be able to write it into a questions box and we will try to answer as many as we can. Now, with climate change becoming an increasingly pressing issue, it is important that we talk about how some of the issues we see today arose from our history. When I traveled to Belgium and France to study the two world wars, I was genuinely surprised to see the changes that made to the landscape during conflict, which still remain over a hundred years later. I'm incredibly excited to talk about the environmental implications and consequences of the first and second world wars and how they tie in with current issues today. Now, when researching the First World War, many historical photos show bare, war-torn, trench-filled battlefields. With this in mind, Dolph, could you explain how the wars affected the landscape of countries? Yeah, it, it's really fascinating when you look into these uh, these periods in our history, that conflict, and, and, you know, as Canadians, we know so much about how it impacted our cultural landscape as a coming of age uh, moment, um, the significant loss of life, the tragedy of losing 60,000 young people out of a population of 8 million. Uh, it was huge. Um, but the theater war was was far afield in Europe. And the scale of it, you know, for many Canadians, it, it might seem elusive, but we're talking a thousand kilometers stretching from Belgium uh, to Switzerland. And literally this line uh, of trenches and supporting routes, uh, providing supplies for this, this band of conflict that was going on. And uh, I think we'll, we'll start off by actually uh, showing a clip from Paris 1919, which is a film uh, directed by Paul Cowan and co-produced by our own National Film Board of Canada, Gala Films and Production 13. And it does a really good job uh, describing uh, that impact. So I'm just gonna pull that up now. Four hundred and twenty thousand men died in Verdun. Nine villages disappeared. There's not a single tree standing. So when we <clears throat> when we talk about that scale, you know, not a single tree standing, villages literally being erased from the landscape, um, just catastrophic destruction and loss of life as as these these groups of individuals dug in, and you can see, you know, from from historical images the pattern as they had their zigzagged trenches, the support lines, the supply lines, um, soldiers as as just tiny pieces when you look at aerial photos of that and, and a pattern that may look haphazard, but was a key strategic design to minimize loss of life uh, in a, wor a world where the conflict was largely ruled by hand-to-hand -hand combat and shelling. Uh, so 
you know, this was built to survive these blast patterns, uh, and it really was looking at the environment from a pure strategic lens, high ground, shelter, cover, uh, what is the substrate? So really having a huge, huge impact uh, on that band along the line. All right, so you described a thousand kilometers of trenches from Belgium to Switzerland and how these zigzagging patterns reflected the strategy to avoid shelling and blasts. These mostly describe how the build environment shaped the landscape. Could you elaborate more about the impacts of the conflict itself? So uh, there was a quote I, I picked up in my research. It talked about the Western Front's environment exemplifying contradiction. It appeared simultaneously gruesome, scarred with splintered trees and churned up meadows, meddled with human gore, but also pleasant, uh, covered in bright green grass and full of colorful uh, wildflowers and, and on occasion thriving wildlife. So you had these really contradicting pieces coming together. And, you know, those battlefields, when we start talking about scale of impact, um, from the First World War uh, data sets, they're saying the German artillery fired approximately 222 million rounds of artillery. Um, so this barrage, and, and they, could, they could hurl those projectiles up to 120 kilometers along that line. And it's now estimated that for every square meter of territory on the front uh, from the coast of the Swiss border, a ton of explosives fell. So you, you know, you're trying to wrap your head around the scale of that, um, both from, from a human tragedy point of view, but also as far as just tearing up uh, the ground. And, we, we dig a little deeper into that and we learned that one in four of those shells actually didn't detonate. Uh, you know, they became embedded in the ground and now have become an annual rite of passage in the spring and fall. Um, as, as farmers in Belgium, they talk a lot about their iron harvest at those times of year as they collect those, place them on the roadsides and continue to deal uh, with the legacy uh, of, of the conflict. And you know, it wasn't just the large munitions, you know, you'll hear of individual battles that were done, for instance, where 60 million rounds of ammunition were fired on the battlefield. Um, much of that continues to be there to this day. Uh, so, you know, those, those uh, battles, those explosions destroyed the vegetation, reshaped and lowered uh, the landscape in some cases, compacting it, remixed soil layers, uh, fractured the underlying bedrock. And uh, as Rose talked about in her introduction, those legacies, in many cases, you can still see today uh, over 100 years after the wars ended. Yeah. So there were millions upon millions of rounds that were fired and detonated, leaving lasting craters on the land. You mentioned that roughly a quarter didn't even explode. And now people are still finding these munitions in the land through the iron harvest every single year. That's almost unbelievable. So from what I understand, there were also some lesser known strategies used in trench warfare, such as tunneling below the enemy's position. What type of impact um, Dolph did that have? So, you know, many of us have seen the imagery of those zigzag uh, trenches on the surface. Uh, but when you looked at one of the key strategies to get behind those at times, you could try to go head to head or, or you could go underneath. And there are many cases where uh, these incredibly long tunnels would be dug. Uh, in some cases used to get in behind enemy lines and infiltrate uh, or uh, to plant explosives and have these absolutely massive uh, explosions to try to um, destroy the enemy's position. And you know, when we talk about the shelling, you know, you'd be talking about large impact uh, craters. Here's an example of one uh, with a soldier standing in it for scale uh, from the First World War. Um, and, you know, while that seems large, it's actually tiny when you compare it to um, the, the Loch, Loch Nagan crater. And this is actually uh, visible from space to this day. Uh, and this is actually uh, right below where the German lines were. And British soldiers mined, they tunneled underneath, uh, planted a huge amount of explosives, uh, packed it there, detonated it on July 1st, uh, 1916. It was Canada Day, before we knew it was Canada Day. Uh, and um, that explosion produced a crater that's 100 meters wide and 21 meters deep. So absolutely enormous. And, and when you look at the imagery of it today, it's, it's just this just incredible contradiction as we think about uh, what that day must have looked like and, and the huge human tragedy. Um, but when we look at it present day, it's surrounded by farm fields uh, and the area of the crater has actually had trees growing back in, the vegetation get reestablished. So, Here's this place that was completely altered 
uh, nature has taken it back, but because of that damage, uh, continues to be a protected space. So, you know, it's an interesting tension as we look at those disturbed spaces over time. And all those explosions, I talked a little bit about uh, the habitat and the soil and the gravel mixing up, churning up. Um, these would have huge impacts uh, on the water table, uh, on, on how water flew off the site uh, as it all mixed together into one uh, really impassable matrix and could lead to other issues afterwards, uh, such as, you know, landslides or sedimentation of water. Uh, real problems. So those impacts, you know, are really quite clear when when you look at that historic imagery. As you see huge pools of standing water, uh, we see vernal and, vernal and ephemeral pools frequently in forest settings, um, but not quite like this, where standing stagnant water, no vegetation to be seen, um, you know, all of it representing a huge barrier to wildlife uh, habitat connectivity is a key piece for successful wildlife populations. Animals being able to get together. Uh, so this band essentially dividing. Uh, that part of Europe in two and being suitable mainly for for invasive and less desirable species that we still see in low quality living environments to this day rats lice fleas um, the few species who really can thrive in that and to this day uh, you have to look at it through the different ideas of timelines and scale uh, from a geological time point of view you know where we've carved out the rock and the soil it's still pretty clear uh, where the conflict took place. You can see the bands and the ribbons, the shell holes uh, from a flora point of view, from the plants. Uh, the trees have become established as we look at, you know, a living organism that lives for a century or a few centuries. And then the fauna, last but not least, uh, coming back once that vegetation's there and, and some of them having shorter lifespans, you know, white-tailed deer, 10, 20 years, uh, to other ones that are, are very short-lived, uh, you know, less than a year, uh, moving back into those spaces. So I'm actually going to pull up another clip quickly here, uh, again from Paris 1919, because we, we described it a little bit. And there's a great example here of uh, the German delegation when they're coming into northern France and their perception of what they've seen. Walter Siemens, the lawyer for the German delegation, often writes to his wife during this time. Der erste Eindruck von den besetzten Gebieten ließ meine Seele verdorren. Dann allerdings kam Nordfrankreich. Es war eine erschütternde Erfahrung, obwohl wir von Bildern und Beschreibungen wussten, wie ein Schlachtfeld aussah. talking about uh, that harrowing experience, even if you know what battlefield looks like, um, you know, just, just, just such a stark reminder of the scale of that conflict uh, and the impact. So most of what we have already discussed, trenches, shelling, explosives, and how it affected the landscape deals with the direct impact of the battlefield. Like you mentioned, the impacts are clear and evident with the massive craters left on the land and the sheer destruction left behind. Like you mentioned, even the German delegation was surprised by the sheer devastation. Now, I'm a bit curious about the environmental impact on the home front, something which may not be as apparent as the landscape damage that is seen on the battlefield. Yeah, I found this really interesting when we started to dig in the resources to fuel the war. When you're talking 60 million soldiers um, being deployed, needing to be supported on all sides, uh, that led to scarcity and altered consumption habits, um, both uh, for industry and for civilians. Uh, and the major items really, you know, you think about food, lumber, uh, metals, fuel uh, being the key items there. All right. So can you go through those different items? Can you discuss how an increased demand for these supplies and the mass production of these goods during the wartime period affected the environment? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, you look at Britain as, a, as an island nation importing a lot of its food, about 80% of its wheat uh, prior to the war was coming from abroad. And when we think about those 60 million soldiers, uh, you know, you look at the age group they're in, um, it's not synonymous, but it's pretty close. You can think of 60 million people who can't or aren't, are not farming. Uh, so part of what we saw was a shift in agricultural practices and that shift to industrial agriculture uh, as we needed to 
increased production and, and the messaging that people were receiving, uh, food will win the war, will win the war with wheat, uh, drove huge, uh, huge demand and, and actually moved the price of wheat significantly as well from 78 cents a bushel before the war to a high in Canada of $2.63 afterwards uh, as people really stepped up uh, to support that. And that, that demand and increased price, uh, increased production and increased the amount of habitat used to grow uh, that wheat. So that's where you start talking about an impact to the natural world where in that four year period, we see a 14 million acre increase uh, in the amount of space used to grow wheat uh, in the United States. And, and some people say that's pretty modest if you look at what happened in Canada and the US combined um, and, and as much as a doubling at that time. So we're seeing that increase in space, we're seeing a rise of technology and tractors to help cultivate that. Um, and with that increase in mechanization, we see an increase in habitat loss. And, and that, that is actually a key hypothesis in what happened to the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. We ramped up agriculture uh, through uh, the late uh, 19-teens. It resulted in marginal farmland being used and a lot of traditional prairie being cleared and turned uh, into grain and, and plowed. And when we had the drought conditions, it wasn't as resilient. And we literally saw huge parts of the prairies blowing away, a huge environmental impact, a huge part of subsequent uh, you know, challenges with recession, and no doubt a huge impact uh, to a lot of the species that are native to this area that called it home. So food was important for a country's messaging. Farmers were encouraged by the government to win the war with wheat. And as a result, there was a major expansion in industrialization of farms. Production increased significantly and thousands of individuals were recruited to work as farmers. All this expansion, expansion meant a destruction of habitat. So what did this mean for forests? Yeah, it's a great question when you actually think about the forest, the trenches, tunnels of the front lines, uh, the barracks, the supporting buildings, all required a huge amount of timber to build. And, and forests were of significant strategic importance uh, for those resources, but also for cover. Uh, so we, when we look at, again, the data for the first 700 kilometers of trenches, they estimated over half a million square meters of timber used. And, and over the course of the war, uh, the narrative, uh, the estimates have it at about two and a half billion board feet of lumber uh, consumed, destroyed, removed uh, and, and deployed. So huge, huge impacts on forests, the source of all that wood. Um, and it was forests in northern France that were decimated at first. Uh, in fact, the uh, army actually had an officer placed in charge, a military liaison uh, that could stop uh, delegations from other countries, the British, uh, from what they described as anarchic exploitation. You know, they understood the importance of protecting pieces of these forests uh, to protect other natural, supporting natural resources, such as their water, uh, preventing erosion. Um, and those French foresters actually could say no to felling of trees, even for the war effort. So a really interesting uh, strategic piece there. Um, at the peak, we are talking just under 44,000 workers in this field in, in 1917, 1918, just cutting and providing lumber. And um, yeah, just an amazing spin up uh, to provide that valuable resource through the conflict, but with huge local uh, impacts, as you saw, old growth largely removed, irresponsible forestry practices resulting in, in washouts, degradation of water bodies, and, um, and, and longer term legacies as it takes so long for those, those forests to get reestablished. You mentioned 2.5 billion board feet of timber destroyed or consumed. Such an immense scale of forest destruction is almost difficult to understand. These numbers that you discuss are mostly about Europe though. 22,000 acres of forest destroyed in Belgium alone, in France seeing local extinctions, landslides, and sedimentation. You also briefly mentioned across the world. What did this um, forest destruction mean for North America? Yeah, this is another area where the war came home uh, to North America, uh, particularly with regards to the West Coast forest and Sitka spruce. Uh, it was really important material uh, for the construction of airplanes. It was light, it was strong. Um, and they saw production over, over a few years of the war increase from just under 3 million uh, to over 22 million board feet an annually to meet uh, the needs of the military as planes became one of the key tools uh, in the conflict. 
And what does that mean? It means the loss of a huge number of trees, yes. Um, but equally uh, challenging for the natural world is the supporting logging roads, uh, the mills, uh, the new routes for invasive species to move in those places, and the habitat fragmentation that goes on that presents challenges uh, to wildlife. So fueling that war overseas you know, profoundly changed our forests right here on the west coast of North America for a period. And it's a, it's a bit of an interesting one for us because it's also a source of, of significant Canadian pride. Our 224th Canadian Forestry Battalion worked uh, in Canada as well as overseas. And the British government had concluded who better uh, and uh, who more experienced and qualified uh, than Canadians to harvest timber. And at, at the peak, we had 35,000 Canadians serving in that core. And it's believed we produced about 70% of the lumber used by the Allies in World War One. So a huge uh, piece of uh, strategic importance and uh, and something certainly we could be uh, proud of as our contribution, but no question huge ecological impact here and abroad. Yep, definitely, definitely. Of course, the consequences on these forests were significant, but the environmental implications must go beyond trees. What else was impacted? Um, one of the pieces that, that I hadn't even considered uh, was tin. Uh, as a key uh, component of metal alloys used in axles, in, in bushings and bearings. It's an anti-friction material uh, that was often um, mined through open pits. Uh, and uh, the biggest impact of that actually was in, uh, in Malaysia, what's now Malaysia, uh, the Dutch Indies at the time, uh, where they saw huge increases in demand for this project, product, huge increases in price, uh, but huge impact on the national natural environment uh, where they literally uh, cultivated tens of thousands of acres and, and worked to, um, to dig that out of the ground. Uh, those mines, you know, they're quite a scar on the landscape as they dig down. Um, the extraction process is invasive. The processing of it to extract the ore uh, is, leaves quite a legacy, and that's still very much there today. Uh, the other key item was, was fossil fuels, uh, whether it was uh, gasoline oil for the vehicles or coal, uh, for the steel mills, uh, they were of major strategic importance. And you saw countries like Mexico um, being major players in the petroleum trade, uh, Germany actually invading uh, Ukraine to access more coal in 1918. Uh, these, these were critical resources uh, for individual war efforts. Uh, and at those times left a significant environmental legacy in their wake. It seems like the increased demand that came with the war required an incredible amount of resources in many different industries, such as wood, in non-renewables, non such as tin and coal. Some of these environmental consequences must have been expected. Now I'm wondering, what were some unexpected environmental consequences of the war? Yeah, when we think about the, the battlefields, you know, many of those areas were pretty well developed uh, already. We've been literally farming there for millennia. Um, but, you know, the removal of trees uh, and a lot of that cover, uh, so people had long sight lines, really had an impact on, on large mammals uh, and birds. Uh, longer lived species, things like European oaks, uh, removed, uh, destroyed, and, and weren't replanted in most, in most cases. We saw a transition uh, to faster growing softwoods and conifers like pine and spruce. And the result of that uh, mass planting event at one time, a good thing to try to get nature to recover, is now we have monoculture plantations that are often all aging out and dying at the same time. And those monocultures aren't as robust and resilient to disease. So some really uh, clear impacts in the theaters of war. Outside of that area, what was interesting is how when Europe entered into the war, it was a key production center. Uh, it was kind of the industrial heart almost of the world with a few spots in North America added. When they came offline, a lot of those other areas started having to provide their own materials. So you saw this industrial development and that spin up of urbanization and those industrial uh, factories uh, popping up all over the world, which uh, was really sped through uh, the need generated through the war. Yeah. So some, some environmental consequences were that forests weren't as rich. They were all planted at the same time and they were all dying at the same time and that the industrialization grew due to the detriment of Western Europe. These impacts that you discussed, both expected and unexpected, seem quite significant and far-reaching. It's almost difficult to truly understand the extent of these consequences. What happened to all of these um, environmental destruction and the pollution of battlefields following the war? <laughs> 
Yeah, well, you know, you had these completely uh, modified environments through shelling, through human activity, um, you know, the, the plants and long living trees largely gone. And a lot of individuals actually took the steps uh, to clean that up. The government supported uh, and, and people actually talk about it, uh, that, you know, it was just it was unbelievable the scale of the of the damage. Uh, but amazingly, within uh, within half a decade, you hear stories of folks visiting back in the 20s and saying uh, nature has things coming back. It's starting to reclaim things, uh, but you'd still have the physical legacies there, uh, the geological ones, as well as the major structures that were built. And when I actually fast forward to the Second World War, uh, they talk about with the shelling uh, and the impact of the two wars combined that it'll likely be 700 years until a lot of those ordinances are safe and those spaces can be uh, really inhabited without any fear again and the government won't have to have those uh, teams in place to be pulling out shells that continue to come to the surface to this day. These environmental impacts seem complicated and difficult to resolve. Like you mentioned in France, it will probably take roughly 700 years until certain areas truly become safe. Did countries attempt to mitigate these consequences and work towards recovery? Oh, absolutely. You know, and that, you know, that work started almost instantly, you know, in, in 1919, uh, they were already talking about farming and, uh, you know, getting the first four hectares of certain areas going. And, and a year later that had expanded uh, to literally hundreds. So uh, it's an amazing story of, of nature's resilience and recovery uh, in some cases, uh, but it's, it's very speciesist. In some, in some cases, uh, they talk about only the trees keep a record of their suffering. Uh, those those um, perennials, those annuals that grow back seasonally, uh, they recover a lot faster than those, those hardwoods and the rest of it uh, that once gone literally will take a human lifetime to come back. Uh, the other thing we've watched come back is these forests. And, and we talked about the monoculture. Here's an example of a conifer uh, one. Um, they're replanted. They're usually fast growing with commercially uh, valuable species, uh, but they change the whole composition of the ecosystem and what lives there. Uh, and that has a real legacy piece. Uh, the good news is once you get those roots in the ground, you stop some of the erosion, some of the runoff, uh, you can stabilize uh, stream edges and the rest of it and uh, not have to deal with as much hardscape. So part of that recovery is getting nature and in some cases giving nature that head start. In some cases, recovery has been slow, but in the end, nature has proven itself to be resilient. Could you elaborate more about how nature has recovered from the impact of the war? Has recovery been successful or have there been some irreversible consequences? Oh, there's no question that when we lose uh, pieces of nature, it takes a long time if it can ever uh, come back. And uh, that's particularly true at the battlefield site where um, some people see all plants and green as good, uh, but invasive species and other uh, compositions have changed things dramatically. Um, but when you think beyond uh, the front, when you look at the habitat that was lost, you look at um, the fossil fuel uh, work that went on in the Gulf of Mexico, the environmental legacy there and the damage um, of those quick developments and spills lasted for decades. Um, in other places, you can still see the impact of deforestation and agricultural expansion. Uh, those wild spaces you know, are far smaller than they've ever been uh, and may be too small to actually provide adequate habitat for certain species. And when you fast forward to some of the, the present day uh, conflicts, we, you know, we think of Vietnam uh, where they literally dropped 70 million liters of herbicides, you know, Agent Orange, DDT, uh, to remove forests, to be able uh, to, to engage in conflict, to see, to see the enemy and, and the, the impacts of actually putting those dioxins, uh, they persist in the soil to this day, We've seen huge decreases in biodiversity of birds, uh, of mammals. It's, it's incredibly sad uh, to see how that, that incredibly rich jungle of Vietnam has, has declined. Uh, those dioxins also have a huge impact on humans who live there today. It's, it's in fish, it's in fowl, and children have a very high rate of uh, blindness, blood disease, and birth defects uh, as, as an environmental legacy. Uh, the other example that, that really hurts when we look at the natural world is the first Gulf War, where where the scorched earth policy upon retreat, um, we're talking you know, oil spills to the tune of four to six million barrels and uh, slicks that were 160 kilometers wide, um, 68 kilometers long and, and 13 centimeters thick. So you know, imagine 
you know, that much oil just sitting on a water body in the impact, you know, that's that's far larger than an Exxon Valdez. That's far, that's in the scope of the deep water horizon. And those legacies, um, they haunt us to this day. So millions upon millions of barrels of oil and 70 million liters of toxic herbicides such as Agent Orange and DDT were spilled across ecosystems with lasting effects. I'm wondering, Dolph, how did how did or how do these consequences impact the individuals residing in these affected regions? Well, I think there's the immediate effect, right? When you talk about literally villages uh, being wiped off the face of the earth and reestablishing that uh, to the farming, to those wild spaces. Um, but back here, when you leave the theater of war, you, you picture our Canadian and American prairies uh, where literally millions of hectares gone. Um, habitat for uh, prairie dogs, for sage grouse, uh, for animals like this is a black-footed ferret that, that we actually are doing breeding uh, recovery and release at of at our Toronto Zoo. They're still struggling uh, a century later uh, from the rapid agricultural expansion and uh, shortness of habitats and habitat fragmentation. Uh, so those, those are really real challenges. Uh, when you think of the tin mines that we talked about, you know, Malaysia is one of the most dense, densely populated countries in the world. That space is really important to recover so they can have more space for housing. And, and there's literally 14,000 square kilometers lost right now uh, to that legacy. So it makes us reflect on changes to our environment over time, the ones we can see in our lifetime. And then when we really look in, in the time machine and look back, what did good used to look like and how much have we lost since then? Yep, there have been so many changes to our environment over time. It's almost hard to imagine how we can work towards a healthy environment. However, we have to start somewhere. Dolph, do you think we can see any similarities between environmental issues today and those from the world wars? Well, I think there's certainly something to think about there. Um, in periods of crisis, you know, we'll do whatever we can to survive and, and, and humans um, will use nature, exploit nature as required and at unprecedented levels at times like that. Um, I also think there's a, a really clear line between politics and the politics of the day and, and their view on environment and economy and how we need that healthy environment to have a thriving economy. And, and it's scary, I think, when we, look, uh, when we look to the future. We see damaged landscapes and ecosystems. Um, we see uh, biodiversity loss at an unprecedented rate. And all that's important because as we lose those species, uh, you know, yes, it's a tragedy, but it also makes those ecosystems less stable and more prone to collapse if additional pressures are added and, and those are beyond climate change uh, or the other threats they're under today. So when we think of healthy ecosystems, uh, you know, they're not going to be filled with stressed animals who are, who are shedding viruses and uh, animals on the edges of the range. Um, those are big threats to nature recovering quickly and big threats to us as we think about the origins of this pandemic as we see zoonotic diseases making that jump. Uh, from animal populations to us. I find it very interesting how you mentioned that damaged and vulnerable ecosystems lead to increased risks of diseases and viruses, especially since we are, as you said, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we wrap up our discussion, Dolph, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, one of the things that I kept bumping into is, is this notion of, of human impact in the environment, uh, conflict, uh, accidents, and, and what, what they called accidental wildlife sanctuaries. Um, we see you know, biodiversity actually increasing and improving in some cases where we have minefields. Uh, the area around Chernobyl has become uh, this, this park where megafauna is, is actually making a resurgence. Um, so it's an interesting um, perspective on human impact on the natural world and sometimes our persistence uh, and presence uh, being so detrimental to other species. So, what can we learn from our past so we make sure we don't, uh, we don't repeat it? And how do we protect the natural world on purpose as opposed to what we're seeing in some cases nowadays, uh, which is these protected spaces um, being set aside for, for other reasons with, with such painful histories? Mm -hmm. In a period of crisis, the human drive to survive can result in massive exploitation at unprecedented levels. And such was the case during the two world wars and with the plastic waste boom we see today with the current COVID-19 pandemic. As Dolph discussed, by examining our history, we can discover how some environmental issues that we see today arose 
and we see similarities between the overproduction of goods and the exploitation of natural resources during the world wars in our modern day industries. We are seeing how these issues, past and current, leave lasting impressions on people, flora and fauna, landscape, and the overall environment. From looking back at our history, we can look forward and face the issues of our present and our future. I would like to thank Dolph de Young for his thoughtful and informative answers. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask some of my burning questions. Now, we are going to open the floor to the audience and let you guys ask some of your own questions in a brief Q&A session. On your screen, there should be a small question tab where you can type in some of your thoughts. We will try to answer as many questions as we can and we are looking forward to responding to them. So our first question is from Roberta Ann and she asks, what was the, what was the specific effect of barbed wires in trenches and on battlefields? As far as impact on the environment, um, that's an interesting case. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, the resting process and the oxidation process, if that would have had local impacts on it. You know, we see a lot of, of legacy items, metal ones being dug up as well as, as wood from those really rich environments. Um, but as far as environmentally, I'm not sure what, what the, the uh, specific impacts that would be, unfortunately. Um, the key piece of that was, was steering people and, and the security it provided and uh, certainly the challenges it probably left for years as they needed to clean up those spaces. Now for our second question, Mark is asking, did the massive shelling and expenditure of explosions after the climate um, alter the climate locally and regionally? Um, wow, that's that's a great question. Uh, you know, there's little little doubt in my mind uh, when you look at the scale of the explosions and the fires that you would have uh, microclimates and in some cases um, the heat and intensity of some of those, uh, you know, I dare I almost call them weather events, uh, would have totally incinerated seed banks or any uh, living tissue um, pre preventing the recovery. Uh, so, we, you know, we see cases of that in the more modern wars uh, with the larger weapons, particularly nuclear weapons and those uh, types of releases. Uh, so, yeah, a really interesting question and, and something that would be fun to dig into a little bit more. Um, we also know the other piece about the First World War, the deployment of gases as a key, as a key tool, a particularly barbaric tool, um, not necessarily creating weather, but using weather uh, strategically as, as a big change. And those deployments would have huge impacts on any air breathing animal. Uh, and not discriminating between humans and, and the other organisms living in those spaces. That's a good answer. Now, Caitlin asks, Dolph, can you speak about extinctions related to the First World War? Um, it was interesting uh, going through, you know, they talked about uh, particularly tree species, you know, and, and not getting to species levels, but European oaks uh, just being completely removed uh, from from entire uh, regions as they were harvested and used uh, as per as per what we talked about earlier. Uh, you know the, the the mammals in many cases were already fractured. You know a lot of that area um, was was farmed and cultivated already. Uh, I didn't get any any data on specific species, uh, but there's no question uh, that that um, when we looked at biodiversity pre and post war, uh, I don't have a number for you, but a significant decline along that thousand kilometer band uh, as as, um, as really a stop for a period uh, for all animals passing through and for all animals living in that space, uh, those local extirpations. So Renee now wants to know, are there, was there any long-term pollution, for example, such as lead from the world wars? Um, there's no doubt that there, that, that legacy is still in the soil. Um, and, and, I actually ended up chasing a, a few little rabbit holes. Uh, you know, this, the war within the war, uh, when it came to environmental impact, uh, jumped out at me on the Atlantic. Uh, we lost huge numbers of ships. I believe it was around 5,000 uh, ships through the Navy and Merchant Marine that were sunk uh, by uh, German U-boats. And I believe they also lost about 178 of them. So uh, there's no doubt in my mind when you look at the, the fuel release uh, for those events, uh, as well as uh, the legacy, because any of them would be leaking over time, um, would be continuing to be, um, you know, a, a real, real local problem in the environment. Mm -hmm. So we have a comment and question from Steve. He's heard that in some battlefields during the First World War, the elevation of the ground was hit by so much artillery that it was lowered upwards of 10 meters. 
how would this affect the soil and the environment? Yeah, that was that was something, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at the geology, you know, as as the foundation for what plants are growing on, what trees are growing on. And you'd have significant, um, you know, churning uh, through the shelling, uh, followed by incredible compaction as you get this new matrix of soils uh, binding together. And the key result being you don't get the uh, the permeation of any groundwater in some cases it's literally pooling on top or has to has to flow to the sides so changing that hydrology uh, completely alters the scenario and, and the types of plants you're going to have get established and then when you add things like you know if a, if a vehicle was blown up you have fossil fuels added to that um, you have a pretty uh, pretty challenging uh, mix of things for the habitat that was there to get re-established and you get those early succession pioneering species that can deal uh, on the edges a little more effectively, often taking root and in some cases uh, continuing uh, to live there. And, and in many cases, I describe a, an alternate stable state, uh, a new uh, world with things growing in it, but not necessarily resembling the, the original habitat uh, very much. We've got a question from Stella now. Even if flora and fauna have made a resurgence in areas like the Zone Rouge in Verdun or Chernobyl, Chernobyl are the animals and plants healthy? Or are they filled with toxins and disease? Well, it's a great question, and and there's no doubt, uh, you know, the animals, you know, for instance, living in, in a radioactive exclusion zone are going to have higher levels of radiation than than their counterparts. Uh, but when we we look at animal well-being, you know, we look at things like are the populations growing? Uh, what are we seeing as far as reproductive rates? And um, the the issue of toxins on board in many cases. Uh, is usually only an issue for their first generation offspring uh, and if there's somebody else eating them. Uh, and the example I would bring, for instance, is uh, I think we look at our, our killer whales on, on the west coast of Canada, uh, where their firstborn calves tend to be dying at a higher rate. And that's because a lot of pollutants are concentrated in their body fat. And the first time uh, they lactate, those, those pollutants actually get turned into milk and literally fed to their offspring, resulting in a higher mortality. Uh, but they do find subsequent uh, calves have a higher survival rate. So I think that's the type of thing you would see, not in a radioactive scenario, but in other cases where you have persistent organic pollutants uh, that could bioaccumulate and be passed on to offspring. All right. So Cameron has some comments. Um, he says, so not much of a question, more of some comments on the Canadian forestry corps. There were only 24,000 Canadians. The remainder were foreign laborers, including uh, prisoners of war, Portuguese and Finnish sailors. There were also four battalions, including the 20, 224th, the 242nd, and the 230th, and the 238th. Um, following up on that, he would like to know what you have read about the Canadian Forestry Corps during the Great War. He had recently wrote a thesis on their operations for his master thesis titled Yeomen of the Woods, the Operations of the Canadian Forestry Corps from 1916 to 1919. Uh, well, well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, if you have your master's in it, uh, you've spent a year or two reading about it uh, compared to my uh, my few months. Uh, so yeah, I, I didn't come across that, but I'll certainly keep my eye out and, and thank you for that correction. All right. So um, we're waiting for, oh, okay, we got another question from Christopher. He's asking, did the legacy of environmental impact of the two world wars inform national environmental policy in Canada? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, Canadians are interesting in that there's been times uh, like uh, with CFC gases, we have been uh, true leaders uh, during during the uh, 80s and 90s uh, and earlier. Uh, we were leaders as far as setting aside parks and protected spaces, but I'm not sure if, uh, if, if I'm aware um, of any connection between those war legacies and uh, environmental policy uh, in the in the post-war periods. That, that would be something really interesting to, to take a deeper dive into. Mm -hmm. Sasha wants to know, do you have any thoughts about the impacts of nuclear fallout in places such as such as you mentioned in Chernobyl? Um, well, well, clearly, you know, the human toll of that accident at the time and then uh, cancer rates uh, going up in the subsequent years, I, I think that's been been quite well documented and studied. Uh, I, I run back to the, the fact that as, as challenging as it is uh, 
in those environments uh, with the levels of radiation um, that that those risks seem to be less than that of actually living in close proximity with with humans and the impact that that you know large scale farming has on their wild spaces uh, when they need large tracts of lands and, and and that's particularly for the large carnivores they often range over a huge distance. Uh, they're, they're isolated animals. They live on their own except for uh, mating. Uh, so they need these big tracks. Uh, so um, yeah, again, that's another one of ones that I would need to dig a little deeper in. Uh, and, and what we are seeing is a lot of these large species um, at higher numbers than we've ever had in the, in the past and issue, new issues surrounding things like poaching in those areas uh, becoming a concern. Uh, so that's where it's worrying from an animal uh, well-being point of view, but also a human well-being. If people are consuming uh, meat from animals from those areas, you know, the risk profile goes up significantly. We now have a question from Ro Roberta Ann, and she's wondering if it is possible to discuss the effect of war on the human population in terms of so-called environmental impact. Could you repeat that one? Um, she's wondering if it is possible to discuss the effect of a war on the human population in terms of environmental impact. That's that's a, that's a, a big question. Um, <laughs> you know, let me go to a place where where I'm comfortable. Um, we you know we've watched uh, Richard Louv and his his book Last Child in the Woods uh, explore the connection of humans and our and our mental health and well being uh, to spending time in nature. Uh, so there's little doubt in my mind, uh, folks in highly degraded environments, you know, in the scene of war, in these urban environments that have been decimated, um, you know, no question that's going to have a profound impact uh, on their mental health and their well-being. And, and those healthy environments are key parts of, of the recovery. Uh, it's a big question. I, I'm not sure where to, where to go on it. If, if maybe, Roberta, you, you want to elaborate a little, but we could try. Steve is saying he has a few comments uh, and a question. There was a fantastic exhibit at the zoo last fall showing the world war in color with emphasis on environmental impact. He's wondering if there are any plans to hold another exhibit along the same lines in the future. Um, yeah, well, we, we've really enjoyed our, our partnership with the Vimy Foundation and that chance to share uh, that really impressive exhibit uh, with our guests. And, you know, when we look at moments where nature has, has uh, really been impacted and, and taken big steps back, as far as quality, often they're connected uh, to wars and conflicts. And, and we think of uh, Central Africa uh, during some of the uprisings and, and the rise of the bushmeat trade at that time. And even the pressures right now with COVID-19, the absence of tourism dollars has resulted uh, in increased harvesting illegally of a lot of uh, mammals uh, as people really are fighting to get by. So, you know, human conflict and uh, human challenges uh, tend to trickle down to those those megafauna in particular. So yeah, we'd like to keep working with the with the Vimy Foundation. We've been talking about how do we uh, connect people to these moments in time, raise the profile of, of both the human tragedy as well as the environmental toll of these impacts. Again, so we can continue to learn from our past to have a better future. Mm -hmm. And we have another question from Alex. He's wondering what the risk of removing aging undetonated shells from the bodies of water around France, around France are. Is it worth the risk to leave them where they were dumped in the water or is it better to remove it? Um, I can't speak to the ones in the water at all, unfortunately. Uh, the bulk of my reading was really along um, the front itself. And, um, you know, that mix of, of the professionals and, and watching uh, some documentaries on, on the professionals who actually go into the country, uh, collect these, safely transport them and detonate them throughout the year. Um, but also, you know, the farmers who have been dealing with these for, for lifetimes and watch their parents deal with them. And at times what almost appeared to be a cavalier attitude about as far as collecting them and kind of tossing them off to the side of the row. Uh, road that often seem fearless. Uh, so, you know, it, it's interesting what people get used to culturally and the risk. Um, you know, the, the risk is still real. Uh, you can see based on how they treat it. As far as things in the water, uh, there's the unexploded ordinance. Uh, I think the other thing we've seen more uh, dealt with in the water, but I don't think it would go back as far as World War One or Two anymore. Um, when we have ships sink, often they're carrying huge amounts of fuel oil or bunker oil and the importance of recovering that before it, it leaks into the environment because it can have really profound impacts on the ecosystems, even small amount uh, of, of hydrocarbons. Now, Robert, Roberta Ann is wondering, 
Did tank warfare, especially separate tank divisions, have a specific effect on the land? Um, the key piece I, I bumped into with regards uh, to tanks, uh, track vehicles, and other large vehicles uh, was they were one of those legacy pieces that that seemed to to um, have, have more latency. It took a while for them to get cleaned up. Uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, Rose, if you actually saw any of that when you were there, uh, but that, that was, I think, literally uh, decades before that was all cleaned up in some cases. Uh, whereas the other elements, the scars on the landscape, either the trenches or, or the other uh, uh, fortress type uh, installations, you know, some of them still persist to this day. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Um, Renee is wondering, do you know how much of an impact the Pacific War had on specifically orangutan or rhino populations? Ooh, um, I, I don't, um, but you know, when you look at the Javan rhino, for instance, uh, you have an animal that is, you know, really just on the edge of extinction right now. And, um, you know, there's little question that it, it was a long road to get there. It's not a large area, uh, but uh, animals like that are so vulnerable and particularly on island populations where there's nowhere to go. Um, so I can't speak to that. Uh, but, you know, you were talking when we look at, again, that Pacific theater, and I'm actually thinking Second World War in my limited reading. Um, but when you're uh, removing huge areas for airstrips, you're building military bases. Um, the key thing for so many of these animals is they need a place to live. And um, when we fragment that, when we break that up uh, and we leave impacts that have a long term legacy or continue to operate there, um, they're going to be less likely to recover. So uh, that would be that would be probably about as much as I'd be comfortable uh, saying on that. Steve is also wondering, are there any hard numbers that you have of global temperature or greenhouse gas increase um, increasing after the war? I don't. Uh, that would be a really interesting uh, piece to look at, though. You know, I think a lot of us talk about uh, carbon loading and, you know, passing the 400 parts per million piece uh, of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and the impact that has uh, as far as the trajectory and, and climate change. It would be interesting to take a, a more detailed look at what the what the graphs and the, and the data says uh, from really, you know, 1913 to uh, 1923 and that period where you know, the world slowed down in some areas, but sped up tremendously in others. Uh, it'd be an interesting uh, thing to look at for certain. Cameron is also wondering now, how much of an impact do you think that prior environmental damage had on environmental damage that occurred during the war? For example, did the deforestation of Britain prior to the war worsen the damage caused by rampant logging by the Canadians during war in the post-war period? Yeah, well, it's interesting, right? Uh, we have to be really careful, and I've had to be really careful when I uh, apply my colonial Canadian perspective. You know, our, our First Nations, of course, have been here uh, for millennia, but really we only, uh, as Europeans arriving here, have been operating in North America for a few a few hundred years. Uh, that's not the story in Britain and France, where literally you have, you know, castles and the rest of it that are thousands of years old. Uh, so you had an environment that was already significantly modified, and and that notion of old growth as we would expect it uh, would probably be very different. Uh, so there's no question in my mind that the war, uh, in some cases, you know, further um, impaired some of those forests. They probably significantly reduced the amount of core forest, which is the key piece. You know, there's certain animal species that are really shy and they need big blocks of land to live in. Um, and whether you're selective cutting or clear cutting, uh, there's no doubt in my mind in Britain and in France, uh, that those those species would have been profoundly impacted over that four-year period. Yep. Sarah is wondering now, which species do you think were the most negatively affected by the Vimy conflict during the First World War? Yeah, well, I think I, you know, I think it would be a pretty terrible time to be a terrestrial mammal, uh, in particular, because you know you have uh, literally. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people deployed with firearms who aren't eating very well. Uh, so I'm guessing you know, any megafauna or even large rodents uh, would really face a terrible fate. Uh, they, they, would, they would be the, the worst off in that type of scenario. Uh, I have no doubt, uh, even smaller things, you know, birds can generally go over, uh, but you're also talking about organisms, you know, that, that expression canary in a coal mine isn't a throwaway. Uh, if you have the use of toxic gases, uh, and other things uh, being deployed, uh, 
uh, they're going to be amongst the most sensitive to that as well. So um, it'd be tough for me to pick an individual species, but but I have no doubt uh, the human impact on mammals and, and those ground birds uh, would be enormous. Christopher is wondering, have any governments ever expect, accepted responsibility for use of chemical weapons in violation of the Red Cross protocols? Ooh, uh, that, that's, that's well outside. Uh, outside of, of my reading, um, but um, where I, I did uh, get spend a bit of time, you know, when we looked at the use of herbicides and those dioxins uh, and the subsequent uh, dioxins that were left behind, you know, there is a lot of questions about responsibility and, and who bears that responsibility to this day because the legacies continue uh, to present day as far as uh, families and children impacted. Um, but no, I'm not, I didn't come across that, but um, to your point, I think there's a lot of atrocities and things that have gone on in the past uh, that still appear to be unanswered. This is a question from Jennifer. Dolph, if you could have a conversation with political leaders currently engaged in conflicts, what would you say to them in terms of the impact on the environment, such as, for example, in Syria, Yemen, or Afghanistan? Well, I think it, uh, yeah, it's a, wow. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I think I think you know, there's there's times where it's really tough to get to that higher level purpose. But this notion that we are all connected, uh, when you see uh, this notion of a scorched earth policy, when when, when uh, troops of a variety of colors are falling back, um, that legacy is one that uh, even though it's not on your side of of a border, you will carry. Uh, so I think we see that more and more as you know we we get people wrapping their head around one earth, one environment. Uh, so uh, the conflict, I, I don't think any of us ever want uh, to be there or to see those things, um, but understanding that, that nobody gets to divorce themselves from the legacy of the actions on the natural world. Yep. Unfortunately, we have now run out of time. Thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you all so much for tuning into our webinar today and a big thank you to Dolph DeYoung for his wonderful answers. I would also like to thank our series partner, the National Film Board of Canada. The organization is Canada's public film and digital media producer and distributor and provided the clips featured in our webinar today. I would also like to thank our webinar partner today, the Toronto Zoo, which is dedicated towards connecting people, animals and conservation science together to fight extinction. We hope you have enjoyed our discussions today, which were the third installment of the Vimy Foundation's Beyond the Ridges series. We hope to see you in our future webinars as well. Once again, thank you all for joining us today and I hope you all have a great afternoon.